stand goes. Tampa Bay's killed the penalty. We're still tied at one. Camper shooting the score! Steven Camper's first National Hockey League goal. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of Drop the Mitts Hockey Podcast, um, episode 43, and we've got an incredible guest here today. I'm so super excited about this one, especially being a, a big Bruins fan, um, Stanley Cup champion, USA Olympian, NHL journeyman, uh, Steve, Stephen Camper. Stephen, how you doing, man? I'm just surprised that you put me at 43. I thought you'd have waited until at least 44 and give me at least my number, right? I literally was good. I was, I literally was looking at that today, and I thought we were on 43, and I was like, God damn it! Like as soon as I saw that, I'm like, God, fuck. But <laughs> man, honestly, can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your day. Obviously, I know you know got a lot going on. It's the off season for you now. How have things been? How's the family doing? It's good. Uh, you know, again, thanks for having me on. Um, happy to be here. Um, you know, we we just got home. A week ago Friday so uh, a lot of getting stuff done at the house we haven't been here for eight months so um, whether it's organizing or, or just seeing old friends that you haven't seen and trying to get our son acclimated with um, with the kids in the neighborhood all over again yeah man I can and again I think people forget that human aspect of things is like what it means to you know pick up and move all the time and especially during the off season um where where are you guys staying are you guys on the east coast still uh yeah so we're we're down in hollywood florida here so um you know we have a a pretty good community here um we actually just took a walk with one of our neighbors and and they have a, a daughter that's a couple months younger than teddy so um it's great because we have i, I believe five or six families roughly 10 to 12 kids that are all within a year or so of each other so it's perfect for these kids to grow up to grow up with. And, and, you know, all the parents, obviously we all get along. And um, when we get the kids together, we just kind of let them run around and, and cause havoc. So it's uh it's good to get back. Um, you know, obviously you miss some things when you're gone, but you know, it's like, we, you know, it's like anything now, everybody's got these group chats. So you don't feel like you're, you're not included, but it's um, it's good to kind of see everybody again and, and be around them. You know, as far as like besides like family time and obviously you're going to be training in the off season. Is there any other things you enjoy doing as far as like, are you a golf guy? I'm a big golf guy. I was actually, I was out there earlier today. Um, my wife would probably <laughs> wish that I wasn't on the golf course as much as I am, but yeah. it is kind of my safe haven. It's, it's the, if I'm ever really like overthinking something or stressed out, I, I just go hit golf balls. We have, um, what is it from uh, something about Mary, you know, the, uh, the golf course or the, the range where they hit into the water. Yeah. So that's yep. like, two, uh, that's like two miles away from my house. So and it's still oh, up really? and running. So um, I'll go over there and just hit golf balls um, just to kind of clear my head or, you know, it, you yeah. don't have anything else to think about. It's, it's you and a, you and a white ball and in a field. You guys have some beautiful courses down there too. It's like every time I go on vacation down there, I'm always trying to like, you know, convince the fiance to let me bring my clubs. It doesn't usually go over well, but man, like I always love playing down there as much as I can. It's incredible. I mean, we have, I mean, with where we live, we have four public courses within probably 10 miles. And then within another probably like 15, 20 miles, we probably have another 15 or 20 private courses. So there's, there's courses all over the place down here. That's beautiful, man. And like I saw, I saw some news today. Um, you had posted on your story that you're the new co GM um, with player development coach Anthony Perticaro. I hope I'm not butchering his name. I per probably Perticaro, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, um, team five in this so um, in this SoFlo league, are you going to be playing as well as like being a GM? Like, how does this work? I'm just I was just reading up on this, and I'm like, this is insane. Yeah. So it was funny because they kind of made it seem like that we were like done taking over a team, but um, I, I saw that and you were like, no, like I'm still playing like this. I, I got, I got a bunch of texts and calls like instantly that were like, are you done? And I'm like, no, I'm not done. <laughs> um, 
So what had happened was um, <clears throat> a few years ago, I got approached at the gym by a couple guys and they were like, Hey, we have this three on three hockey league. Would you be interested in playing? And for the first year, I kind of just brushed it off because I was just like, I, you know, I, I, I wait until mid July to get back on the ice. I'm like, I don't really want to skate. And then these guys kind of kept talking about it. And I was like, all right, like there's a good, I mean, we have a good 12 to 15 guys that we train with. Um, and then they just kept talking about it at the gym. And I'm like, all right, what is this? What's going on here? And then, so Brandon Duhame, who uh, just got traded to Colorado or played with Colorado at the end of the playoffs, he was like, hey, I need a guy on my team or like a guy that can come play for our team. Like, can you play? And I was like, sure. And he's like, no, he's like, I'm asking, like, I need you to like really come play. He's like, it's just me and a couple college kids. He's like, I need another guy. So I was like, yeah, I'll come play. And then um, fast forward about a year, we had uh, Josh Levo, who had played in the, in the National Hockey League. Um, Alex Galchenyuk had played. Um, both Sergachev brothers, Sharon Govich, Zadorov, Lomberg. Um, you know, we had started to recruit a bunch of guys that were down here training in the summer and started slowly building this up more and more and more. And the more guys that started coming down, the more that we started skating with over at the Panthers rink, we started generating a little bit of buzz behind it. And at the time we only had four teams. Well, you're playing three on three, you're dressing six guys, a team, maybe seven. If like you, you're like, okay, like there's there, you know, we want an extra guy. So we were more or less running out of room to expand the league. So then the guys that had created it, uh, Cole Codsey, um, approached me and Anthony earlier this year and were like, would you guys be interested in becoming like, because we were, Anthony and I were on different teams. They were like, would you guys be interested in co-GMing a team since like camps you're gone in the off season or in the year you're gone during the season Purge is here. Can, can you guys just help facilitate a team? And we were like, yeah. So we ended up um, working it out that he and I were going to be GM players and coaches together. So, and then, uh, Three days ago, we had an expansion draft, and I, I actually I thought they were going to drop that today too. So, um, so we had drafted some guys. Like we we had like kind of like the same thing that Vegas and and Seattle did, um, where they got to protect one or two players based on the team, and then we were allowed to select um, uh, an um, an NHL college or AHL player. Uh, from each team, we're allowed to select one of those, and then one um, kid that's either in juniors or college right now. Um, so it's kind of like we're drafting almost for the for the future to kind of create more kids that keep coming down to playing. So that's more or less like what what this league is, and and it's a lot of fun because play one game a week. It kind of keeps the competitive juices going. Along with that, it's you basically play four mini games in one session. So like it's it's four 10 minute periods, but those 10 minute periods are a game. And you have your your they have stats, they have you know goals, assists, um, things like that. And we play on a small, like a really small rink, almost a three on three sheet rink, like very small. Yeah. Um, but it's just to work with, with like a lot of it is like I'd say 90% of the guys that play in that league work with Purdy. Um, on all, like on other days and do skill stuff. So it's a perfect time to work on your skills. It's a perfect time to kind of keep, like I said, the competitive juices going along with having a little bit of, um, I guess, bragging rights right. per se of, of the league. So um, it's fun. You know, it, it's, it's something cool. And especially with, with how well Florida and Tampa have done in the last five, 10 years, you know, hockey is continuously growing. So if we can create these things where we start doing it and these games are, we're, we're still trying to figure out the timing for games, but if we can start doing them later in the afternoon or, or nighttime when more kids are starting to get to uh, the rink there at, in Pompano, the more that they see like, all right, well, those guys play in the NHL, those guys play in the American 
American Hockey League. These guys are college kids. Like, oh, they're all down here in Florida. So then it's going to kind of create a little bit more of a buzz for South Florida sports to kind of continue to grow. Now, you, like, as a puck, obviously a puck-moving defenseman, that's the kind of game you've always played. Like, what's it like playing on this smaller surface? Like, obviously, you just played a full season, this huge ice surface. Like, what is the adjustment like? Like, how long does it usually take you to kind of get used to, like, the significantly smaller ice surface and you're playing with, like, other grown-ass men, like, on this surface? Yeah. It's, it's, it takes a, I would say it takes probably, like, one of those games to get kind of into it. And then after that, it's kind of second nature. But I mean, things happen so fast. Like, right? Um, you, literally, like you turn the puck over, it's a two on one the other way. Like, you you almost have to play have a guy that's strictly playing defense because things can happen so fast. Um, but it's great because it gets kind of that that little short area touches, like the quick plays, a lot of like a lot of give and goes, a lot of touch passes. Um, and then if, if you can shoot the puck, you know, guys start screening the goalies and then, you know, you get these goalies that are they're gassed after a little bit because they're going post to post. So then it turns into kind of a free for all from the from the point there. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Like I said, they do something similar in Boston at uh, at their academy where you're getting a lot of these guys like Coil, a lot of these like Hockey East guys and you watch just how fast plays develop, right? And, like, it's constant back and forth. So it's it's cool to see another league, you know, down south especially, um, kind of incorporating the same thing. And I, I think that's awesome, especially for growing the game. Well, it's, it's huge. I think just this, the like like you said, just the growing the game part, it's – and honestly, it gives us something to look forward to in the middle of the week. Like, you know, you get to the dog days of the summer where, it's you know, you're in August and you're skating. It's like, all right. All right, well, hey, we got a meaningful game here tonight. Like it could possibly be, you know, for a seeding in playoffs to get a bye, or you know, you could be in the play-in game now. So it it kind of keeps that 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 competitive edge, like I said, going. Yeah, man, I, I kind of want to I want to get into like this season. Um, yeah. You obviously you captain the uh, Tucson Roadrunners. Uh, AHL affiliate of the Arizona Coyotes. Um, obviously, we got the the terrible news that they're moving obviously to Utah now. Um, can you kind of speak to the the misconception? Because a lot of a lot of people that we've talked to, I've talked to, don't necessarily think Arizona is a hockey market. Um, and you obviously having you know the front row like playing for the team, right? Like, can you kind of speak to to what hockey was like in Arizona? Um, do you feel like ho- hockey belongs in Arizona? Like, can you just kind of talk about what it's like to, uh, you know, over in Arizona as far as the market goes? Well, <clears throat> I, it's tough because the the ink really isn't dry still on this sale. But uh, right for the fans of Arizona, they are passionate about the sport. They are passionate about having the team there they're passionate about the players they're passionate about you know the the coyotes everything like that they were by far engaged everybody thinks that it's not because it's you know any any southern market kind of gets the well there's other things to do arizona fans or tucson fans they would show up for games it didn't matter if it was on a tuesday night or a saturday night they were there and your fans are always going to be your fans. It's unfortunate that they lost the team due to what was going on. And I wouldn't say that it's, it's not, it's not, not a hockey market. It is a hockey market and they've done a really good job of promoting the game. I mean, you look at the junior coyote program where our, our, my head coach this last year, Steve Potvin, he, he started out in that program um, as like a coach and then turned into a skills coach with the, with the coyotes and then arguably, or then worked his way up into being an assistant coach with Tucson and then becoming the head coach. So they are building the game the right way. I mean, Michael Grabner still lives out there and runs the U 10 or U 12 yeah. program. Um, and, and you look at how well that they did this year, like their team was going, I think they went to nationals. Like they're, they're good. They're, you know, it's a hockey market. I mean, if, I mean, if, if all else fails, you, you got, you got two kids 
three kids right now that you can say that Arizona created, right? You got Austin Matthews, Matt Nyes, yep. and Josh Dome. Yep. All three kids, two of which played a full se- – two of which played in the NHL. One's a bona fide – might might go down as the best goal scorer ever. Matt yep. Nyes, I played with him at the Olympics. He's an absolute stud. Then you look at Josh Dome. Josh Doan was born and bred in Arizona, went through the whole Coyotes program, grew up playing that way, moved away, went to Colorado or went to Chicago Steel, came back and played at ASU because he wanted to be home and wanted to build up that program because they were just starting. He wanted to build that program up. That's just the kind of person that he is and that their family is, that he he went through all of this to go back home. He could have gone to other schools. Yeah. He went back to ASU to build that program. He did. And then you look at what he did at the end of the year. I think he played nine games. He had what seven points? Like he was. Yeah, I mean, he he'll, be in, he'll be he'll be in Utah next year without a question. He's he's a unbelievable hockey player and an even better person. So, um, it, it hockey belonged there. Hockey. I hope that at, at some point, I hope that they figure it out and they go back. Um, yeah. Just due to the fact that like. People like going there. I mean, it's 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 no different than, you know, Florida for the longest time. Like when I when I played here in 2014, 2015, like we missed the playoffs. And and the next year we we I think we won the Atlantic Division. And the the difference of fans when we weren't winning to winning was incredible because then people started showing up, we started getting full houses. Because people do care about the sports, but if right. you want to put a team out there, a product out there that's going to win, people are going to come, and that's right. You know, and that and that's just how it is, especially in warm markets because they have other things to do. But Arizona definitely has built a program up there that could and should be in Arizona for a long time. Yeah, it's funny you say that, man, because you're you're definitely not the only person that has said that. I mean, I think the like I mentioned earlier, the big, big misconception, just because they're moving, that does not mean that they're not a hockey market. That does not mean that the fans are not passionate. We had uh Jordan Schmaltz on, obviously he's, you know, Nick Schmaltz brother said the same exact thing you did. I mean, they were always fans in there, always passionate. It's, it's tough to see, but you know, getting that, you know, your, your kind of perspective on things, it just, you know, it, it sucks for those fans. It's it's awful because they have spent what twenty something years being fans. You know they they moved from Glendale to ASU and like they still. I mean I, I get it that's fifty five hundred fans, but like they still went and watched games. Like hundred percent. The 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 people that that grew up watching Arizona Coyotes hockey are so loyal and they it, it's like. It's like the Cardinals to them. It's like the Diamondbacks. They are so loyal to their sports, and they want sports to be there. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, it shouldn't have been taken away from them. It shouldn't have been moved. But that's the nature of the business. And and like I said, hopefully in five years or whatever, when they, they have the opportunity to possibly get a team back, I hope <clears throat> they get an expansion team, and then they go back. And, and I hope that these fans, you know, pick up where they left off. Hundred percent. I I agree. I I really hope that you know they can make it work again. Um, man, going back, you mentioned guy like Josh Doan. Um, you got to wear the C. One of the older guys on the team, right? Um, you know, can you can you speak to the development of some of these younger guys? I mean, it's it's exciting times for you know for Coyotes fans. Um, you know, Utah fans now. Guys like Josh Doan, you mentioned Connor Geeky, Dylan Genther. And then on the back end, guys like Mike Kesserling, who, you know, is he's from close to us here, um, and Victor Soderstrom. What was it like watching those guys develop? And, you know, did you kind of take that role as like a mentor to them? Well, that that was a lot of it, right? Is you're you're the older guy. Um, you know, you're still there to to contribute, do your job. But a lot of it is, and and like I told the guys at the beginning of the year, you know. We had, you know, myself, we had six, seven other guys that, that had been through a lot on that team that had, you know, four of which that had been there for four or five years. Um, you know, it, it, we we had a leadership by committee. It wasn't just, 
It wasn't just the guys that wore letters that that were leaders. We 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 bred guys to to how they how they should act, how they should, you know, communicate with each other. Um, you know, the work ethic every day of, um, you know, there you know it's it's no different than any any job, right? You you go there's some days you just you just don't have it, or some days you just don't feel good, but it's putting on the, you know, the positive mind frame of, of showing up, doing your job, getting the most out of what you can that day and, and being encouraging for your teammates, because, you know, especially in the American league, things, things happen quickly. And, you know, you could be playing really well and, and somebody else gets a call up or, you know, you could, you know, be leading the team points and somebody else gets a call up. It's, it's understanding, the situations that everybody's in. And that's the thing that, you know, I, I can go back to, I think last year when I was in Grand Rapids, I was still, I was older coming back. I played the last four years in the national hockey league before Russia, where I was like, oh, okay, like I, I can still do this. I can, but I, I didn't fully appreciate or understand the fact that I was now the older guy that I needed to kind of, help mentor these young kids where I think I took a little bit of it for granted of like, okay, like I'm just, the, I'm going to be the next guy kind of thing. And, and that's, and that's on me. I, and that's kind of the one, you know, I'd say regret that I had of, of that season was, was not kind of doing what I did this year of, of, you know, being encouraging, helping the guys understanding the situation because, you know, we have guys like, like you said, donor gunner, um, geeks came in at the end there, but you know, if, if had it not been for the the twenty year old rule, he would have been with us all season. So, right, um, you know, Kess, Soda, I mean, Vlad Koyachanuk, Maxim Zuber, yep. um, you know, you you look at the list goes on and on for guys. I think we I think we led the league in in call ups this year. I think there was, I think, I think there was what seven. There was eighteen of us at yeah. Some there was a ton got called up. Like I said, I was going through the um, list and I was like, do I just name all these guys? Those are the just the guys yeah. notably as far as like ice time goes yeah. that I was looking and, at. And and I, you know, a lot of it was um it was understanding the moment. You know, there there's times where if somebody gets hurt, a certain guy's gonna get called up. And and you know, I, I kind of took that on my shoulders uh, along with talking to to Steve Poffin and and John Slaney uh, and Zach Sortini, our coaches of like when guys get called up, like, let me handle like the guy's moods because I understand that there's times where, you know, guys are going to be in their feelings a little bit and, and rightfully so, like we've all been there. Um, and, and, you know, you try to build relationships of, Hey guys, like, listen, I've anything that you guys have done or will do. I've been there. I've been in that situation before. I understand the pros and cons of it all. So um, any questions like, and I told them, I was like, listen, I was like, I, all I want to do is be a small part of your guys' career. Um, and I hope that you guys remember, um, you know, what we went through because, you know, I, I'm getting towards the end of mine and I just want to, I want to have fun and I want to see you guys all succeed because, you know, at some time or another, you guys are going to have situations where you have to lean back on and you're going to remember something and, and hopefully it's a, you know, a positive moment. So I just, I, I more or less just, you know, led that way. I, I wanted them to understand that I had an open door. My phone was on. If guys had problems um, to call me and like, you know, I think the, the hardest thing for me um, was I got hurt so early on in the year where I missed, I missed 20 something games real early. So, uh, but you know, kudos to the guys. Um, a lot of them would call me after games I on the way home or, or when they were on the road, just to, um, kind of see what I like check in to see if I saw something or, you know, just kind of more or less, I was just there venting the soundboard for them. They're venting sessions where they could have conversations. And, you know, I was, I was really fortunate. I room with Dylan Gunther on the road for the, for the first little bit. So I got to kind of get to know him a little bit better. Um, and, and more or less just, um, understand where his head was because there was a I, I never forget this there was a time we were in san jose and he was he was just 
not struggling because I don't think I don't think him struggling ever happened. Right. He just he was forcing plays a little bit too much. And I was just coming back. I just started skating from my leg injury. And I looked at him and I go, Can I be can I be blunt with you? And he's like, please. And I just looked at him and I go, What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and honestly, he was like, he goes, What do you mean? And I and like we, you know, we were we were fortunate, like after the games, they'd send us our, our clips and and we sat there one night and we just sat there. We ordered Chipotle and we we were sitting on the we were sitting in between the two beds and I had it up and I was showing him. I'm just like, what do you, I'm like almost like turned into a coach at the moment. And I just right. looked at him, I was like, just simplify your, your game. Three games later, he was he had I think he had five points in five points the next two games, came back off a of break, and then had like a hat trick and he was gone. And then next thing you know, he scored 19 goals. And I, I sat there and I'm just like, and and he and I kept in touch when he got called up and and I, I would just look at it and I just started laughing and I'm just like, I go, this kid has all the tools. Sometimes you just need that almost that peer to peer moment of like that harsh reality of understanding yeah. something. And, and he, and kudos to him for, for taking it how he did, because I can understand if a kid was like, Oh, I didn't do that. Or I, I don't, I don't do that, but he took it and he he ran with it and and i mean you saw what he did the second half of the year and then yeah it was incredible and then i mean you look at a kid like you know you brought up josh stone and i i can't say enough about that kid he's he's one of my favorite human beings i've ever seen in my life like he and i talk pretty much every day so he's got a special place in my heart is and i love i love his dad uh and his family so um but Donor was the kid that, good or bad, always showed up with a positive attitude. Always showed up very, very happy. Very, um, all right. What's the what's the day looking like? Here are we going, or where are we going? And you could just tell that he was outgrowing the league, and you could just tell over and over and over just by how he played. And <clears throat> he wanted the puck at certain moments, and then you know he and I were on the same power play unit, so it was kind of he and I would have conversations and Justin Kirkland along with us, we'd kind of just be like, all right, how are we getting donor the puck? Because something's going to happen with this. Right. And then he just got to the point where, um, again, we're in San Jose and, and we all went out to dinner after a game and, and he walks up to me and he, he like whispered in my ear that he was getting called up. And I, I honestly, I felt like a dad at that moment. I just, I almost started crying because I was so happy for him because he had, he had earned it. And, and it wasn't that it, it wasn't that he deserved deserved it. He earned every bit of that call up, and he went up there. And then his first game was was incredible to watch. Um, and then he just progressively got better and better and better. So, you know, it was it was awesome, awesome to see. Yeah, you know, and that it's honestly going back to the Dylan Genther thing. Like that, it's so encouraging because so many times nowadays you hear these like fucking horror stories about these kids that don't want to learn anything, right? And the fact that you were able to be so blunt and honest with him without him crying and without him like taking it personal, like that, that really goes to show his type of character, right. That he was able to kind of take that criticism and and really use it as motivation, understand what you're saying and apply it to the ice. Right. Like just feel so many times. nowadays. He he is such a, yeah, you're good, man. Sorry. Such a salt of the earth. You know, he's such a salt of the earth kind of kid too. Like he, he's, you can tell like he's got so much skill, but like he works his ass off. Like we get into hotels and I'm 35. I'm going and laying on a bed and I'm like, dude, I'm dead. He's like, I'm going to go down and ride a bike and go for a stretch. And I'm like, you know what? Fuck. All right. Well, I guess I got to do it too. Um, But, but it, it's stuff like that. Like that's, that's the, that's the, the caring that is the commitment that is the willingness to want to get better. And I, I remember before that whole thing, he had gone probably like five games, five, six games without a goal. And I was, I was still on my, my scooter. I'm sitting there and I'm doing a workout and morning skate ended. And I, and I, I was just getting my workout started and, I hear like we had like a shooting gallery out behind like our workout center or workout area. And I hear somebody shooting pucks and I'm just like, who the hell's shooting pucks? Like everyone's gone. He's out there shooting pucks. And I'm, I look at him, I go, what are you doing? He goes, 
well, I haven't scored in five games. Like I gotta, I gotta hone in my shot right now. And I was like, dude, go home and take a nap. He's like, no, he's like, I'm, I'm not leaving until like I hit this like 10 times in a row. And I just sat there and I watched him and I'm just like, and then he does it. And I was like, Hey, I was like, you're getting, I was like, you're going to get one. If it's not tonight, it's tomorrow. And he goes, he's like, yeah, I hope so. I was like, no, I was like, you will. I was like, I'm like, you're fine. And it, but it was like, it was so encouraging to watch a guy like that who was a first round pick. I think he was 11th overall. Yep. But just have that care and commitment to want and the willingness to want to get better. Like those two were incredible. And it was, it was awesome to see. It was awesome to be a part of. And like I said, it was, it was, it was, um, it was an honor just to be a small glimpse in those guys' career because they're going to have long careers. And you, you know what the best part is, those two are really good friends. So I hope that they, um, they play together for a long time. I love that, man. And like I said, you 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 hope that they look back on these experience that the, that they had with you, um, you know, as they get older and kind of treat the younger guys when they're at, at that point, you know, the same way. Um, man, I want to get into, you know, more about you and your career. Um, you've had a crazy fucking career all over the place. I mean, you're you're one of the one of the like un, most unreal journeymen, man. I'm going through all these teams, but starting off, obviously, you're you're from Ann Arbor. Um, you had four great years at University of Michigan. Um, thinking back, man, what was it like playing for such a such an iconic program? Um, you're even seeing now, you know, in recent years, the amount of talent that they've been pushing through. Um, you know, what did that program do for you and your development? And and can you kind of speak to your time um, spent there? Yeah. Um, obviously, being from from Jackson, being 30 minutes away, it was. Uh, Obviously, a lifelong dream to kind of go there. Um, and, and the f- funny thing is, it actually came down between Michigan and Boston University, were the two schools that no I was way. I was really looking at. Uh, David Quinn recruited me. Um, I really, really, really wanted to go to BU. I fell in love with the city um, when I was 14 years old. We went on, like my mom, dad, and I went on a visit there. Um, I fell in love with it. It was before Agnes was was fully built. It was like just. Yep. They they had like the ground done, but it wasn't. They were still playing out of the old rink, but they were like, by the time you'd get here, you'd be in the new rink. And honestly, like just the the cobblestone of Boston, I um, I fell in love with it. I, I and and um, you know, it was uh, it was it was hard to make that phone call when um, when ultimately I chose Michigan because I wanted to wear the winged helmet. I wanted to I wanted to go to Michigan. My mom had played golf at Michigan. Um, and on my 16th birthday uh, was when uh, Red Berenson called me in, in, or I guess I, I guess I went into their office because like they weren't technically allowed to call us, but right. uh, went into the office and and they offered me a full ride. And I, being a stubborn kid, I was like, oh, you know, I got to take some time to think about this, <laughs> knowing all, like knowing full well that I was going to commit to them. Right. Um. But I mean, honestly, it was. Uh, it was great. I um, I went there as a as a pudgy little kid. I uh, didn't know how to work out. Didn't know how to how to train. Didn't know how to eat. Um, and you know what? It took me probably until my sophomore year to really understand, you know, the training aspect. The the wanting like I, I just kind of glided on skill. Um, and then, you know, I was fortunate I played with uh, Jack Johnson, Matt Hunwick, yeah. um, Kevin Porter, Cogliano, um, yeah. you know, guys that had played for – or guys that went on to have good careers. And, you know, you saw them, how hard they worked and how hard they trained. And then you started to really understand that, all right, well, now i got to start training. So probably until my junior year, I didn't really train, um, until, train hard. And then um, – you know, I owe a lot of a lot of success to um, obviously Red and Mike Barwis, um, who was with Rich Rodriguez when he came over when he took over for the football team, and Mike Barwis um, took over our program. Him and Dan Moses kind of took over our program, and and Jim Plocky, and they they transformed me into a guy who actually enjoyed working out, enjoyed 
cardio where I hated it before, <laughs> but they made it fun. They, they made it fun for us. And um, so I owe a lot of success to those guys. And then, you know, Red was the brutally honest coach with me of I could play bad or I could play good. And, and he would just give it to me straight. And, you know, there was times where I, I, I was like, this guy hates me. I'm like, this guy, I don't know how I'm going to ever win with this guy. You know, kind of the woes me. Um, but honestly, he, he, he taught me how to be a pro. He taught me how to be, how to, how to walk the walk and talk, the talk, I guess. Um, and, you know, my, my junior year, uh, when I got hurt really bad, you know, obviously Mike rehabbed me back, um, from my injury. And then when, when I got back, you know, I, I had a really good second half of the year. I think I played 20 games or something like that. Um, played really well. And I, at the time I was drafted Anaheim and, um, I wanted to sign in the worst way. I wanted to leave school early. I wanted to, I wanted to be one of those, I guess I wanted to be one of those kids of like leave school early, go play. Yeah. But I, I, I just felt like my game was there. I really did. And I remember, um, my family advisor at the time was like, okay, we can get it done. He's like, but red's going to want to have a conversation with you first. And I was like, and, and that's just how much he respected red was like, he's going to have, you need to talk to him before you make a decision. So I walked into red's office and I had a conversation with him and he looked at me and he goes, you're not ready. And at this time, like, I was like, yes, I am. And he's like, no, you're not. He's like, you're not ready. And I was like, why am I not ready? And he's like, he listed off, like, you're not strong enough. You need to do the, you need to play this way. You need to work. You need to do this, this way. And just kind of listed off like three or four things to me. And he's like, I want you to think about that before you make a decision. He's like, come back to me in two days. He's like, and we'll sit down. We'll have a conversation again. He's like, because listen, he's like, if you go anywhere right now, you're going to play one, two games. That's it. And I was like, okay. He's like, so let's just wait. Let's have a conversation. So I walked back in and he goes, did you think about it? And I was like, yes, it did. He goes, what's your thoughts? And I go, I'm like, well, I think I do this. And he goes, okay. He pulls up tape and he goes, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. And he was showing clips of like Jack Johnson, not Hummel, to me playing in the National Hockey League. He goes, if you come back, I guarantee you, I will make you ready for now. I'll make you ready when you walk out of this place. Wow. So I go, okay. I was like, there's the deal. I was like, you, you give me your word. I'll give you my word. I'm coming back. So I ended up coming back. And then my senior year was my best year. And he treated me like I was a professional the entire year. It didn't matter what I did. He, he treated me the exact same throughout the entire year. Good, bad, or indifferent. We, we had conversations every, uh, every Tuesday, me, him, and our D coach would sit down we watch video and it was breaking it down of what I was doing good, what I was doing bad, what I wasn't doing indifferent. And how do we learn from that to build for the next weekend? And, you know, between him and Billy Powers, like those two made my, made my senior year unbelievable. And it made that transition to, to when I, I, I got traded from, from Anaheim to Boston. It made yep. that transition to going to Providence so easy for me that it was, it was actually, I, I was like, I remember getting to Providence and I was like, so shell shocked the first, you know, practice. I'm like, man, these guys are big. They're strong. Like I was the biggest yeah. guy in college, like, cause you're a senior. Right. And then when I played my first game, I was like, I just remember sitting there leaving the game. I'm like, Oh, I can do this. And yeah. it was all because, you know, those two had had the time and the patience and, and Mike putting in the extra effort with me in the gym to make sure that I was, I was more than ready to go. And it wasn't just getting ready. It was being more than ready to go. So, you know, like I said, the, without, without that group of people, I don't know if I would have ever made it. That's, that's unreal. It makes you really wonder like what could have been. And like, obviously you go on and you move, you get moved to Providence. Um, and that kind of goes into my next question. Like, I feel like you were kind of the one that kind of paved the way for these, like, not small, but like smaller puck moving defensemen. Obviously, it kind of started off with you, guys like Tori Krug, Matt Grizzlick, um, who have also had great careers in Boston. Um, would you say that early on, did you feel like being a smaller, like puck moving defenseman at the point that you got to Providence um, was a disadvantage? 
Um, and then what, what do you feel like specifically about your game that gave you so much success like early on? Cause obviously you played, you played for the Bruins the year they won the cup, right? I believe it was 38 games. Um, yeah. 10 points, five, five, five goals, five apples. Like what about your game? Do you feel like gave you success early on? I think I was just fearless at that point. I, I didn't, I didn't care what was going to happen. Um, and honestly, you know what? I, I was I was very fortunate. Um, I had Bruce Cassidy as our D coach um, yep. in Providence, um, and, and Rob Murray was the head coach. And, and you know, it, as hard as Butch he was on me the last couple of years, like he's he's hard coach, but he, you know he demands you know perfection. The thing was, is he he was he was as hard. It, it, it's easy for me to say, like. He was hard on me then. He, he was harder on me when I got back, when I came back to Boston. But he was hard on me then, and he and he taught me how to play the game the right way. He taught me how being a little bit smaller to use your advantage. Like I, I mean, I was fast then, right? Um, but like I said, I was I was just fearless, and I, I had no, I didn't care. I wouldn't say care. Care is that the wrong the wrong word. Um. I knew that if I jumped up in the play, I could get back. Right. It was kind of the the feeling that I had when I first got there was I can make things happen offensively by jumping in, but I could also see the play well enough to make a pass. Like I was like, I felt like that was always kind of the my my niche, I guess, was I, I could move the puck really well. Like I, I could make that first pass. Um kind of seamlessly when I was, when I was on my game and, and kind of get us out of the zone or, or on the power play or whatever, but it wasn't like, I wasn't going to do anything to razzle dazzle or flashy. Like I was, I was more of like just your, just a quick puck move in and then jump up and try to meet the fourth guy on offense and just beat their four check. And, and that was kind of where I had my success in the first couple of years yeah. before I got hurt. Um, at the end of that year, the end of the 2011 year was where that, you know, it kind of hit a hit a roadblock there for three years. Um, you know, it's easy for me to say now I'm well past that, but you know, I did hit a roadblock for three years there where I, I couldn't I couldn't stay healthy because I right. like again, like you said, I was a smaller defenseman. I was getting hit. I was I was taking the brunt of big guys playing against third and fourth liners. Like you're taking big hits right. and um you know, I, I, you know, I remember I came in my, my rookie year, I was 185 pounds and I thought that was, a, I thought that was big and, you know, and it, it took me until year seven before I finally got to the weight where like I could actually withstand getting hit and, and, and it just took me a long time. And, you know, I, I had a lot of injuries that, that kind of, sidetrack some you know i guess some development um but you know it was all part of the learning curve yeah and man and going back to this 2011 team you obviously you were a rookie at that point i'm going down the list of some of these defensemen i you know just remembering some of those iconic defensemen you know big z zidane ochara dennis seidenberg johnny boychuk andrew ference adam McQuaid. like you go down the list like playing for that team being as young as you were Obviously, that was the cup winning year. Like, what did what did playing with those guys teach you um, about being a professional? And what what did playing with those guys kind of do for your development, both you know mentally and and both on and off the ice stuff? Well, it wasn't just it wasn't just them. It was the it was collectively right. the entire group. Um, well, and that's and that's what I'm saying. Like even going through the forwards, guys like Sean Thornton, you know, Greg yeah. Campbell. That that whole team was just Nathan Horton, you know, Milan Lucic yeah. at that time, right? Like you go down the list, like that team was iconic. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll start it off this way, and I'll kind of get into what you what you were just referencing there. So my first year in camp. I was paired with Z through the entire camp. We had Mark Stewart at the time too. Um, about Matt Mark Hunwick Stewart. was there yeah. at the time. And Matt Hunwick was there before he got traded. Um, 
And I remember that, like, I remember walking into that year and I was paired with Z in camp and I, I played, I believe three games with Z and I'm like, I remember going, like looking back and I'm like, why did they just keep playing me with this guy? Like they got to get their pairings going. Like, and I just remember looking at the the roster and I'm just like, they got seven guys or six guys, seven guys plus Quater. Quater. I think Quater is the only guy on a two way at the time, but he had to go through waivers and he would have been scooped up in a second. And so I just remember like looking at that lineup and I'm like, this is going to be, like you're going to need three injuries before you get in there, but like, just make sure you're ready. And like, you just like seeing how Z prepared sides prepared, um, you know, obviously I knew Matt Hunwick and trained with him all summer. Um, and, and you watch guys like Gregory Campbell and Sean Thornton um, and, and Nathan Horton. And then you got guys like Patrice, obviously, who's, you know, unbelievable. And then, you know, I was a rookie and, and Marshy was, a, I believe, a second or third year pro and just kind of how he went about himself and, and what kind of role that he had to create for himself or carve out. And, um, you know, you learned how to more or less pick up like the good tendencies that they had and kind of incorporate them to yourself, whether it's training or everything like that. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, so it, it was funny cause we, we came back for the, the 2011 thing this year for the centennial year. Yeah. And there was, a, I believe like 14 or 15 of us that were there. And that's funny. Cause I, that was the, we were all sitting there talking about it. And I, I, I specifically remember bringing up when we were there, I was like, we had a game against Dallas and, uh, sides and I started that night. And it gets brought up to me all the time about that game. We have three fights in three seconds. And I remember, I think I had the fastest shift in a, like maybe in NHL history. I think I played one second. Had, had I remember exactly what game. Because they pulled sides and I off the ice. And right off the opening draw, it was it was Sean fought, Sean beat the wheels off of somebody. All of a sudden, we get pulled off the ice. Next thing I know is Gregory Campbell's fighting somebody. And then I don't know if it was Quater or Ference got in a fight. Three second, three fights in three seconds. And I just remember sitting on the bench and I looked at sides and I'm like, what is going on right now? And he's just like, this is how it is. And I'm like, what do you mean this is how it is? And I, I want to say it was like my maybe my 10th game that I had been there. Yeah. And um, and it, we had that roster that was – was built so well because if you wanted to fight us, you had Thornton, Z, Luch, Nathan Horton, Boychuk, Barron's, McQuaid, Gregory Campbell. What's that? Eight, eight guys, nine guys that could fight and fought heavies. I feel like Johnny Boychuk too. Like there was times where he wasn't afraid to like, you know, there were times he, when he, he was like, going, you knew there was his, really something his spot, like his spot check fight is the best thing. I, I if I yeah. ever need like a good pick, I go watch a spot check fight. Like I talked to like what boy and I boy and I like were were joking about that uh when I saw him. I was like, dude, I was like, if I ever need a good laugh, I just go watch your spot check fight. Um but like we could play any any way that a team wanted to play. If you wanted to skill us, we could skill you to death. If you yeah. wanted to fight us, we could fight. And it was just you know like that team obviously was very close. We were all so young. My God, you look at us now. Like you yeah. looked at you know Z Berkey, Creech, myself, Marshy, Seg still plays. Um, how many of us played or still were playing up until three years ago? It was it was insane. Um but we were so young, but like we had so much fun because like we, we knew going into the rink that we could do any, like we could play any way we wanted. And I think that that was back to your last question. I think that that's why it allowed me to play so free that year was because I didn't, it, 
I remember Sean Thornton looking at me early in my early. We were playing Philly. He was like, so, I think it was Scott Hartnell said something to me off a draw. And he looked at him and was like, you, you can't fucking talk to him. He's like, if you talk to him, you talk to me. And that's when I sat there and I'm like, I can play as free as I fucking want. Yeah. Because nobody's going to do a goddamn thing. I mean, and, and honestly, like, that was, and it was, you know what? It was great because I played with Thorny for five years and, and he treated me like a little brother would, would motherfuck me until he's blue in the face a lot of the time, yeah. but he would, you know, he treated me so well. He still does. And I mean, that, that team was, was incredible. Yeah, a- absolutely iconic. I mean, obviously win the cup. Um, you know, I, I think the iconic bar tab, 156,679.74. I mean, how much of that was you? And uh, how much of the, was well, that Marshy? The, was the rest Marshy and Sagan? Well, let's, let's, everything that, that, that gets kind of blown out of proportion because that $100,000 bottle, of, that Ace of Spades champagne was yeah. top to us. But it looks really cool, right? Right. Yeah, it looks cool. Um, it looks awesome. I, yeah, I mean, honestly, like that night was, that night was incredible. Um, I don't remember a lot of it, but <laughs> um, I mean, you know what? Like, it's your one time that you really get to go out and you get to have fun with yep. the guys. Like, I mean, I was 21 at the time. Like, you're 21 oh winning the cup. Dude, like, you're, you're thinking, you're thinking you're on top of the world. Um, and then, and then we obviously, we had to go to Fenway the next day and throw out the first pitch. And I remember we were just sitting on the bus and Marshy and I, Marshy and I couldn't even keep our eyes open. And, and then we had, like, we, we, we had to go in and throw out the first pitch. And we were, I, I just remember just going, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> I ended up thinking I wore, I think I took Big Poppy's jersey and ended up wearing it. <laughs> Dude, like, I, during you know, the, you- during the first do you remember – so your day with the cup, did you just end up bringing it back to, like, Ann Arbor? What Do you remember what you uh, – like, what was your day with the cup? Yeah. So I took it to uh, Mike Barros's gym because uh, at the time he had left Michigan. So then um, I took it to his gym, and then we took it back to the University of Michigan. Um, and my sister, um, you know, was in and out of Mott's Children's Hospital a lot as a kid. Um for, for various surgeries. So a lot of my childhood was kind of going in and out of that hospital. So, um, we used to do this thing every Thursday, um, athletes would go and kind of see the sick kids and kind of walk around and just yeah. try to bring some kind of smile to their face. So, yeah. um, what we did was, uh, we did pictures at the rink and we, um, I, I don't, I forget the dollar amount that we, we charge per, picture but whatever the picture amount was i matched it and we donated it back to moss children's hospital so we did that and then um and then i we went back and we had a like a little get together in my hometown we got a restaurant um did some things outside and then i got it the next morning uh and played golf with it at um at the country club i grew up on Awesome, man. I, I love that. I mean, I always love hearing those stories of, you know, what's done with the cup and you hear some iconic stuff. Yeah. Like I, mine didn't get too crazy. It, um, we just, we had a group of, we had a, a bunch of friends and family together and, um, had a lot of alcohol and then woke up the next day and just continued going. There you go, man. And 2019 you got to set you a second chance at it um i mean another incredible year another incredible team um you get a second goal around with the bees you score an iconic goal eastern conference finals um i i was telling you when we were messaging back and forth my buddy and i were sitting in the crowd actually sitting right behind carolina's goalie and before the game we had had a, f- a couple cold pops and we're like you know who's scoring the first goal my buddy is all waffled and he's like camphor camphor scoring first you know and we're just going we're like okay dude like you know and then all of a sudden yeah. man that that like to that di- to this day like we still talk about it like what do you remember from that goal um i mean you, you essentially set the tone for that series well so it was actually funny because going well charlie had obviously got suspended um yeah. for the hit 
And Johnny Moore and I were kind of the odd man out. I'm like, we we're really good friends. So it was like, it was really weird because like both of us were like, we want to play, but we want the other guy to play. But like, right. like we were like, we want to kind of be in that moment. And I remember the, I think it was the day, the day before it was, we were doing power play stuff. And the only, t- the only time I really knew if I was playing is if I was on the power play. <laughs> like, like, cause we didn't never really had like lineups up for practice. We just kind of had right. them for games. Like if I somehow was in like practice power play, I was like, all right, well, I'm playing tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I was in the, pra- like I was on the power play and I was just like, I like, kind of like looked at Butchie and I'm just like, did I just hear you correctly? And he's like, are you going to fucking go or what? And then that's kind of when it sank in that I was playing. And it was actually, I, I give a ton of credit to, um, we had an optional skate that morning and I, I obviously you're nervous, right? Right. You got a bunch of pent up energy cause it's the Eastern conference finals. I was like, okay. So I, I went out and I was actually, I, I, so I had a deal with CCM and I feel really bad saying this, but I had a deal with CCM and I'm out there with our, with Johnny Moore. I warmed up Tuca like I did every day. Like that was our thing was I would warm up Tuca regardless of the game. Like I would get on the ice and, and shoot pucks on him. And um, I had a warrior stick and I'm just snapping the puck. And I'm just like, oh my God, this feels really good. And Kim Brandvolt was our skills coach. He's the assistant coach at BU now. Um, comes up to me and he goes, you're using that tonight, right? And I'm like, should I? He goes, yeah. He's like, that's cool that you're playing with that stick tonight. And I was like, no I don't know. Way. I'm like, Kimmer, I don't know how I feel about that. He's like, he goes, use this stick tonight. So he takes it out of my hands, goes and puts it in the lock, goes and puts it on the bench. And he goes, don't touch it. Just leave it. And then obviously my first shift of the game, I just remember the, the puck kind of getting popped out and Jojo taken off after it. Yeah. And I just, I remember taking a shoulder check and seeing that nobody was behind me. And I'm like, Holy shit. Like I'm, I'm going to get a break here. And Jojo slides it through the D man's legs, folks legs right to me. And I'm walking down Broadway and I'm going, <laughs> and I remember Danton Heinen standing in front of the net. And my first reaction was I'm going to fucking hit him. Like I'm going to hit him with the puck. And then I'm like, and then I'm also thinking like, well, I might just slide this back door for him to tap it in. And I was, and then I just like in the like split second, I was just like, like, fuck it. I, <laughs> cause I was like, at that time I was like, fuck it. You're never getting a chance like this again. You might as well just <laughs> shoot it. And yeah. And then I blacked out. After that, like the Selly, I blacked out, and I just remember Matt Grizzly. Unreal Selly. He was like, Matt Grizzly was like, "What the fuck? What the fuck just happened?" And I'm like, "I don't know. I don't know." And we got With back conviction on the bench too. And, like yeah, that shot, and, and, man. Like you knew where you were putting that. Oh yeah, I like I I, I will always shoot low blocker, like yeah. for whatever reason. Like I, ever since I was a kid, like that was my favorite spot to shoot. And, uh, oh, sorry, guys, I love high glove. Um, <laughs> but I, I will always, like, I, I, I remember going back to the bench and Kevin Dean was our D coach at the time. And he sits there and he's like, pat me on the back. And I just looked at him and I just go, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> I mean, man, and he just started laughing. I'm it, telling it was you awesome. that goal I mean, was iconic. Like, I'm telling you, man, like, we got so – after that, man, we were going bananas. Like, I, I – and obviously, this was, like, well before, like, we we weren't using, like, DraftKings or whatever. And we, like – we look back on it now. We're like, dude, can you imagine, like, if you would have yeah. actually been able to, like <laughs> – like, Unreal. And, like, I just went back and watched it, man, and it, like, literally took me back. Like, I remember you jumping into the boards. There's a body in the crowd that literally is just, like, flying across if you go back and watch the video. So, it's actually funny because Kevin Dean, the D coach, sent it to me that night. And he goes, I don't know if if you've seen this video, but it's, like, the overhead of the guy falling. 
he goes, we haven't left the rink yet, and the coaches can't stop laughing. <laughs> I was like, but and I just I'll, remember seeing him. I'm just like, what the fuck happened? You just see a dude like fly yeah, was, across. I'm like, crazy. what is this? Oh my god! It was. Yeah. I had. He to went to like. It looked like he went to like jump up on the glass and missed it. I think that's what it was because, but but yeah. honestly, the way that it was like the overhead of it was literally looked like he was just flying across, and obviously they like snapped away from it because like. I don't know if that dude was hurt or anything. Like, probably well worth it. But man, that goal was yeah. fucking iconic. Well, he made NBC commercials for the next two years. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh my god, so I, I love that play. play. <laughs> but man, obviously, I mentioned earlier. You know, you, you've been to various cities. Um, you know, all over the country. Um, the one that really stuck out to me was that you spent time in the KHL with, I don't, I know I'm going to fucking butcher this, Akbar's Akbar's Kazan. Kazan. Yeah, and I had to, like, read that a couple times. I'm like, all right, I got to, like, say this nice and slow so I'm not, you know. But what was it like playing in Russia, man? Like, how much of a culture shock? Like, obviously, you put up great numbers over there. I was was looking on, you know, your, your, you know, your statistics. You put up great numbers. Like, what was it like just moving over there, the way of life? playing in that league like what was it like so what a lot of people don't know is so my last year with the Bruins I had um I had tore uh two ligaments in my hand or my wrist um that I was shut down for um I shut down for playoffs everything like that and I I couldn't even pick up I couldn't pick up a a, anything over three pounds in my left hand for three months um, just due to the the ligaments that were torn. And I remember it was, uh, it was July, July 1st rolls around and um, we were sitting there and you're just kind of waiting for offers to come in. And um, we had a couple, couple offers, a couple two way offers just because of, you know, injuries and stuff like that. And we just come off the pandemic year. And, um, and I was just like, man, do I really, Uh, and I I just remember sitting there talking to my agent, uh, going, do I really want to go back and, you know, play in the minors or anything like that? And my agent, um, Sean Hunwick, I played college hockey with him. His his brother's Matt. Yep. Uh, really good friend of mine. And he's a goalie, uh, right? He just called goalie. Yeah, he's goalie. Yeah, yeah, he was goalie. He was goalie. I played one game in uh, uh, Columbus. Yeah, um, he just called me and uh, was very blunt, and, and which is I love about our friendship because um, we kind of just say it how it is. He's like, listen, he's like, I think you got to do it. He goes, I know you don't want to do it. I know you, I know you're kind of skeptical of it. He, he's like, because at the time it was always, if you go over, you're never coming back. Um, right. And I was like, am I ready to be done? Am I ready to, to be done with the NHL? And I was just like, and he goes, listen, he's like, go over for a year, sign for a year, reinvent your game, see if you can get back to what you were doing. And then he's like, we'll, we'll take it from there. We'll, we'll kind of see where it goes. So I go, okay. Um, and, you know, Akbar's was, was very patient with me. Um, obviously, they had, they had contacted him numerous times, um, excuse me, uh, throughout the year about their interest. Um, and I had just kind of never given it two cents or never given it two ob- or, you know, two thoughts. And then finally it started to become a reality that it was going to kind of happen. Um, obviously I had, I had, you know, my wife and son who was two at the time, you know, you're asking them to kind of move across the world. You got to talk to your family about it. You got to talk to her family about it because, you know, yeah. it's hard. You're moving to a, to, you're moving to Russia. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, I, it's, it's really bad to say I skated uh, four times before I went to Russia because of my wrist. I had skated yeah. three times with no pucks, three times, like Anthony Perticaro skated me four, four times, three times without pucks. One time I could pass a puck and then I had to go over to Russia because their training camp was so long. So I got yeah. over there and so I signed July, I signed July 4th. Um, actually it was funny. We were, uh, I signed July 4th 
and we were on, we were sitting at my father-in-law's uh, lake cabin in, in Eastern Washington. And I remember like, we're sitting there, we're having a cup of coffee and I'm signing the paperwork and my father-in-law looks at it and he goes, what the fuck is that? And I go, remember that conversation we had last night? He goes, yeah, I go, that's the contract. He goes, what does it say? I go, I got no idea. <laughs> we're just hoping it was for all the best. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, I, I got over there, uh, first part of August. I was really lucky. Par Lindholm who had played in Boston was there yep. as well. Um, and Jordan wheel, um, we're, yeah. we're both over there, so, and I knew both of them, so it was, it was nice for me to kind of go over and have them um, to kind of rely on, talk to. And then, uh, yeah, we just, um, you know, our coach, Dmitry Karpilanov, he played in Boston. Um, yeah. He knew English. Um, so we kind of had that connection. And and he and I, from from the day I got there, and – and Marat uh, Ulivian, um, the the GM, he was he was great. Didn't speak a lick of English, but he he would text me quite a bit, and we kind of translate it back and forth. They had they had so much patience with me of coming back from this injury um, that I didn't end up playing until uh, like a, two weeks before the season started because they have they have like 15, 20 exhibition games, like your whole month of August, you're playing like pretty much a, a game, like a game every other day. And um, they had so much patience with me. And then finally it got to the point where like, it was like that day was 12 weeks of like that I was cleared. And I just remember we were in Magnitogors and it was that day. And all of a sudden I get a text from our GM going, you're playing today. And I go, I haven't skated. I hadn't practiced with the team. I had just done like skating drills and he goes, you're playing today. And I'm like, playing today. I'm like, shit, playing. I'm like, I haven't practiced. I haven't shot a puck. Yeah. And we were in Magnitogorsk and I go out there. My first game, I played 27 minutes. And oh, I just remember like, there was a couple times I was like real tentative on like shooting pucks, real tentative on things. And after the game, our coach comes up to me and like we go, go back to the hotel and he's kind of talking to me. He's like, Hey, like, listen, like it wasn't because to play today. He's like the, the sponsors of the team, which is like the people who own it. Yeah. We're getting frustrated that you weren't playing. So they were very patient with me of everything. And then after that, like, I just, I kind of hit lightning in a bottle. Um, yeah. You know, they, they, they really just let me play how I wanted to. Um, they, they, they had systems, but like, I kind of got back to how I was playing my first, my first year pro. Like I, I just kind of skate, knew that I could get back. You know, we had kind of that, you had half the league was NHL ice. Half the league was like the hybrid ice, like the finish ice style where it was like yeah. a little bit wider, a little bit longer. <clears throat> um, but the hockey was was arguably some of the most fun I've ever had just because the the guys treated us so well. And it, it's crazy because like, you know, you listen to to people talk about Russia and they, they say that they, they didn't like it or, you know, the, you know, the people were, were rude or whatever. Like I just kind of took it for like, that's just their culture. I never took anything right. that they said personally. I never took anything that they did personally. I just, I kind of went with the flows, but I was also, I was very lucky that, my defense partner, Christian Henkel, spoke English. We had Alex Bermistrov spoke English. Our coach yep. spoke English. I had five or six guys on the team that spoke English. And honestly, the drunker that they got, the more English they spoke. So <laughs> it was one of those things where I had so I had these guys around that were helping us. They were they were doing everything they could to help us to make us enjoy the experience and and, and you know the the quality of life, yes, it's a little different. Like, but honestly, the food was great. The people were awesome. The organization was fantastic. They treated us like we we're royalty over there, and I can't say a, a bad thing about that place. Like, I mean, for Christ's sake, I, I 
I don't even know if, if it was if you knew this. Uh, like I, I had signed eleven points in eight games, and they offered me a two year extension. And I was like, I remember calling. I didn't know that. I'm like, they're, I'm like, there ain't a fucking chance in hell I'm coming back. I'm like, I'm staying. Like this place is unbelievable. Yeah. And we signed, we signed it, and you know, I, I like I said, I I love the hockey. I love the I love the people. Um, you know, had it not been for for obviously the war, um, arguably would have still been yeah. there. Um, would have probably played another couple of years. Um, and, and you know what? I still talk to a lot of the guys to this day. I still talk to the to the GM. I you know I I message them, say hope yeah. you're doing well. I still follow the team. Um. You know, our our we had a driver over there that that took care of us, took care of my family. They would drive us to and from the practice, go pick up food for us, take us to the grocery store, everything like that. Like I still message him once a month, just seeing how he's doing. Um, you know, it was lifelong friends that you made in in yeah. eight nine months because of of how well they treated us. That's amazing to hear, because like again, you 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 kind of mentioned it and kind of touched on it is like a lot of these stories that you hear from like other dudes that hop on podcasts and whatnot they kind of have these like fucking horror stories right about their time in russia and like you know the, the big one was like the chicklets talking about like the russian gas and all that like is that something that's is that like really a thing over there it is but our team was was very by the book yeah like because so our our team was we are owned by Tatnef Oil, which is the, I believe, the third largest oil company in the world, which doesn't do okay. really like they were the one company that didn't get sanctioned during the whole war. Okay. And so like a lot of it's like obviously they do clean business, like they're they're yeah. you know, well known. Um, but no, we it's funny because I remember I was I was sicker than a dog. We've we'd flew all the way out to Vladivostok and it was a 13 hour flight from Kazan. I remember I was sicker than a dog playing a game and I remember asking for it and our, our, well, their, their trainers are called doctors. The doctor was like, no, we don't do that. And I'm I'm like, give me something. And I remember he gave me like, uh, and this was like roughly three weeks before the Olympics. So like, you're really questioning what can and can't go in your body. And he actually, they gave me a TUE for like basically adrenaline to get through the game. Like they basically gave me a shot of adrenaline to get through the game because then we had four days off, one of which was flying the entire day. Yeah. I slept like to this day, like we still, we still have our group chat going for the guys. They, they laugh about it. I think the 13 hours on that flight, I think I slept 11. Because and you woke up, eight, and you woke up fine. No, I was sicker than a dog. Oh, you were still like, sick at that yeah, point. I didn't. I didn't go. I didn't go. Like, oh, like they went and played like ska in somewhere else, and I just I I stayed back in Kazan and didn't skate. Oh, didn't do anything scared. for like a week. That's unreal. <laughs> That's fucking yeah. crazy. But you got through that game at least with that adrenaline, right? So I got through the game, and I <laughs> don't know how it happened. I just I remember getting on. The, I remember. They have like long benches there because like the coaches are somewhat known for like standing in front sometimes. So they have like long, wide benches. They stand in front of the players. So, certain teams do. Ours didn't, but like okay. I, there are certain teams that did. And uh, it's like the old like Russian 1980s. Like the coach would stand down like in front of the yeah. players, kind of thing. Like there was a couple teams that did that. Um, I remember we were we were playing in Vladivostok, and I got back and. After I think it was like my third shift, and we were, I think we were tied like one one. I just remember getting on the bench, and I just put my feet up on the bench, and our D coach is like yelling at me, and I just go like this, and like we dressed seven D at the time, <laughs> and I was just like this, I was just like, <laughs> like, like I like, go, somebody it. else go, like I yeah. like. Sounds like and, a lot of dudes in beer league. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I, uh, you know, I, you, you had brought up earlier the, the, the Olympics. And I think to me, like that was the, the biggest thing I admire, right. Is like, obviously you're, you know, you're iconic in Boston, man. Like 
with that Stanley Cup run, that goal in 2019 we mentioned. But honestly, the thing that I that's most admiring to me is you know you you got the opportunity to represent your country um, in, in the Olympics, and I, I just think, especially with the the way the game is now, not a lot of guys get that opportunity. Um, can you kind of speak to what that experience was like? The you know being able to put on that sweater, just um, you know what it meant to you. Um, I gotta say, I it it was very shocking, obviously, to get the call. Um, I think that's what started the point of where I got sick because yeah. I. I got the phone call from John Van Beesbrook and we were John Van Beesbrook called me. We were in, we were in Amur and his time was 9 AM. Our time was 3 AM. <laughs> we were a full day ahead, basically yeah. we were like 20 something hours ahead. Cause we were on the full, wow. farthest point of the world. Yeah. And, and, and I, I'm not blaming it because I would have picked up that phone call any day yeah. and, um, but to get that phone call was obviously like, I remember we were, we were on a flight and obviously like your self-service there is like, you're, you're, you know, you're flying. You can't, yeah. you don't really have internet on planes. And I land, I, I remember this. I'll never forget this. I, I land and I turn on my phone and I had my, I had my U S phone. I had my Russian phone. I had like a Russian little like Wi-Fi adapter that could connect my U S phone. Right. And uh, I all of a sudden I have like 40 text messages from my agent, Sean, going, where are you? Pick up your phone. You need to answer this. Like, yeah. And then uh, Tara, I like I text her and she was already back in the States because like we had gone on like a month road trip in January. And um, she she picks up the, or like I send her a text, like, Hey, landed. And she goes, you need to call Sean now. And I'm like, who died? She goes, just call. <laughs> and I call him and he's like, Hey, I'm sending you a number right now. It's John Van Beesbrook. You need to call him right now. Okay. So I call John he's like, Hey, um, do you want to go to the Olympics? And I was just like, what? And he's like, yeah, you've been chosen for the, for the team. And I was just like, oh, my, my mouth, I was on the plane yeah. and like, I'm sitting in like Jason Demers is sitting in front of me. Mark Barbario, Eric Fair, Jordan Wheel, Par Lindholm, yeah. they're all sitting right there. And my mouth just drops and they're like, are you going? And I'm like, yeah. And like the whole plane Unreal. just erupted that I like, cause I was Unreal. like the first one on the team that found out. So the whole plane erupted. I'm on the phone with John talking to him. And yeah, it was, you know, obviously it was, it was incredible. Um, and then obviously we came back to the States. We did like our little mini camp uh, back in LA. Um, and, and honestly, I mean, the way that that team was assembled was unbelievable. I hate the tournament for format. Like we should never, yeah. like you should never go to a shootout in those situations. hundred percent agree. Um, but it, you know what? It was, it was so cool obviously to wear the American sweater to go to the Olympics, um, you know, we were obviously in Beijing. It was a little bit different times there where like family and friends weren't allowed to come, but it was still, it was still the Olympics. It was still you're the best athletes in the world. You're, you're going to the opening closing ceremonies with these iconic Olympic athletes and other sports that you would never get a chance to meet. You would never right. get a chance to, to see. And that was the part that was really cool. Um, you know, that, that, that team that we had, obviously the players we had on that team, a lot of those guys, it's, it's no different than, you know, what we talked about earlier is like, I mean, you look at Brock Faber's rookie year, like we yeah. could have, I could have told you that two years ago. Right. Um, you know, Matty Bernier's like the same thing, or, um, you know, Brendan Brisson, uh, Sean Farrell, you know, Nick Abrazizi, these yep. kids are, they're, they were all studs then, and they're going to be better players now. So it was, it was honestly, it was so cool to be a part of. It was amazing to represent your country. It was a amazing to hear, you know, the national anthem after you won games. Um, obviously, it's a, it, you know, it's an experience that you'll never forget. And you know, we were, we were so fortunate that we, 
when we were there, we got the, we got the full Olympic experience, I guess, you know, we got to be there for opening ceremonies. We had to be there for closing ceremonies. We were there through it all. We got to go to different sporting events. The only one that we didn't ever get a chance to go to that we wanted to was bobsledding just because it was a two hour train ride up the mountain and like, yeah. it was not COVID safe. Um, but you know what? We got the, we obviously got to hang out with the, the women's team. We got to hang out with other athletes that were in our village, you know, curling and the figure skaters and speed skaters. And, you know, it was, it was awesome. And, you know, obviously, you know, we fell short of our goal, but we had fun. We had a lot of fun before and after that. Um, you know, it was a really close group. And, you know, obviously it, it sucked that the game ended the way it did. I think had we had it continued to play in overtime, we would have won. But, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? You can't really right. go back and take that. So, but it was, I mean, it was a obviously a once in a lifetime experience for a guy like me, um, you know, to be able to do it at 30, Two thirty-three years old was was yeah. incredible. Yeah, it's awesome to hear, man. Were were there any athletes that you kind of saw there um, in other sports? Not that you got like starstruck or anything, but you were like, "Holy fuck!" Like that's so and so. Like, were there any other? Doesn't didn't have to be any other the, different sport. Who was the? There was a unbelievable. I forget his name. I have forty-five pictures with him. Um, <laughs> the uh, the figure skater, the men's figure skater. Oh, it's escaping me right now. But so I have I have a bunch Fuck. of photos with him. I have, yeah. I have pictures of this guy when he was shit faced at our in our <laughs> in our like area because like we we almost get kicked out of the village because we were drinking. Now I want to look at look it up. Um, and then Matty Ice, uh, that was a cool one. Uh, Matty Ice was the is the uh, curler. He this was, guy and this guy was American, right? Yeah. Yeah, hold on. Nathan Chen? Yes. Yep. And then Matty Ice, the the curler. Yep. Um, Matty Ice was actually awesome because he, I think it was just an abdicator, made a comment. He's like, dude, he's like, I keep trying to meet this guy. And I think it was when we played Canada in, in the preliminary rounds, like that arena was jammed with every athlete. Like that place was loaded. That's unreal. And um, and after the game, like I remember, like there was like four of us that we looked in our like our DMs, and Matty Ice is like in our DMs, like sick fucking <laughs> win, boys. Like we're like, holy shit, like we're like <laughs> we this made is a it. <laughs> yeah. So then, so then uh, when we lost, we when we lost curling like semifinals was going on or something and it was like the two days after or whatever so like they're though because like the younger guys flew back to go play in college the older guys stayed because like you have to have x amount of players for like each sport at opening and closing ceremonies so we stay we go to the village and uh or we go to the the curling and we're sitting there and Every time this guy would do something, we'd stand up, not knowing that this had to be like that. Something like that. Yeah. We stand up and just start sh- like, oh, man, <laughs> he's like celebrating. He finally looks up at us, sees that it's us, and he's like pointing at us. <laughs> and then that night, that night, it was actually really funny. We, um, Nathan Krejci was, or um, David Krejci was there. Yep. And uh, so Krejci and I met up and th- I, they had a bunch of beer in their their house or their like apartment building or whatever. So he ended up giving me a couple of cases of beer. So I took them back. And uh, next thing I know is Matty Ice comes walking into our room. <laughs> and I'm like, holy what shit. Is happening? <laughs> yeah. So then he's sitting there and he's like, so he's like, they, I think they were done at that point. And he's having beers with us sitting on the couch. Next thing I know is like, we look up and, we have a full blown party going on. Unreal. Yeah, it was it was awesome. That's so it was I mean it was a great time. That's unreal, man. Like I said, that that's one of the biggest things, like being able to participate in the Olympics. Like not not a whole hell of a lot of guys get to do it. Um, and I'm hoping it's something that comes back, like really comes back. 
Um, well, they should let the best players, players in the world play. Yeah, I 100% agree. I 100% agree. Um, but man, yeah, that um, man, that kind of wraps up everything. I I did want to take the end of this, you know, end of the pod to kind of to really thank you and Tara, uh, for everything you did for you know not only, you know, us, you know, me, his Maddie's family, Maddie. I mean, he is that kid talks so highly of you and and he always brings up like man. Stephen Camfer, like, you know, followed me on whatever. And like, all of us are forever grateful for what you and your wife did, um, you know, to help us. And um, again, man, like we're forever, forever grateful for you guys. We're forever fans of yours. Um, so yeah, we can't seriously cannot thank you enough. No, absolutely. It's our pleasure. I mean, like you said, when you, when you guys reached out, it was a no brainer for us and um, anything we could have done to help it's uh, you know, like I said, the, the least the, the least that we could do, and we're glad that um, you know we can help and and do anything that we can. Yeah, man. Honestly, and and also thank you again for taking the time. I know you got little ones at home, readjusting, you know, to life in Florida, sunny Florida. So That's again, man, I think you bedtime. That's great. That's <laughs> there you know. go. But man, thank you so much. Um, you know, hopefully we can stay in touch. I, I'd love to go catch a game of yours. You know, I know I'm, I'm still here in Boston, but. Um, like I said, man, I, I've, I've been a fan of yours since, you know, 2011. So I, it's pretty surreal for me to be able to talk hockey with you. Um, and can't thank you enough. Absolutely. You know what? We'll, uh, we'll always be in touch. So, you know, you got, uh, you got my information and we'll go from there. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Have a good one. Yeah. You too, man. Take care.